गुड मॉर्निंग ट्रेडिंग जर्मन एंड अ वेरी बॉम वेलकम टू दी सेकंड एडिशन ऑफ फाइनेंशियल एक्सप्रेस ऑनलाइन डिजी फ्रॉड एंड सेफ्टी समिट इंडिया करेंटली हैज मोर देन 800 मिलियन इंटरनेट यूजर्स मेकिंग इट टू द वर्ल्ड्स लार्जेस्ट कनेक्टेड नेशंस दिस नंबर इज ग्रोइंग डे बाय डे एंड इज एक्सपेक्टेड टू रीच 1.2 बिलियन बाय 2025-26 एज मोर यंग इंडियंस जॉइन द इंटरनेट द सेफ्टी इज आल्सो एन एरिया ऑफ कंसर्न हेंस द समिट हैज बीन डिजाइंड ऑन द थीम a digitally safe world before we start we would like to thank our title sponsor google our knowledge partner deloitte and our celebration partner radico khaitan let me tell you that the fe digi fraud and safety summit is being telecasted live on our financial expresses youtube channel as well and we have people joining us from all around the country along with you all who have taken out important time out of your busy schedules to be here with us and we are grateful for that we request you to remain connected with us throughout the course of the day by social media led by hashtag #fe dg safety summit i request you to please keep your mobile phones and other electronic devices on silent as well without any further ado with this we begin the first such session of the day titled a digitally safe india please welcome shri rajiv chandra shekhar ji honorable minister for state for skill development and entrepreneurship and electronics and information technology he'll be having a fireside chat with mr anil sasi somerendra barik from the indian express please welcome our other guests up on the stage uh you've taken up uh, this soul at a very crucial juncture in india say on the uh, sorry when you're seeing unpieces that grow in terms of our connectivity across the country but also the upfeast uh, you know with very pertinent problems that come up as we bit this bit side the exponential rate the way that india has done the last few years uh in that context of course you know you've been working uh we had our first privacy law after several years of discussion and debate uh it's up for discussion about how the industry feels about it how the industry feel about it uh we're, we're also working on overhauling the larger technology law uh, the incumbent technology act we're also working on something about anonymized person data etc uh and you know uh, so you was you've spoken about this many times uh, specifically in the context of uh, the data protection bill the the dbdp act is that the the first pointer that you set out way was to balance innovation and also use of privacy uh you know and it appears that that's that's sort of a thing uh, that's like a thing in most of the reasons it also that come out and even the one that we like that, that we've been discussing the consultations that that you'll be doing um are, are on on these areas But for that point, uh, you know, when when you are balancing, say, national security, you're balancing the needs, the need for innovation, and also when you're balancing for digital rights, it appears that the speed on rights, uh, many critics would say, is seeming to be shrinking a little bit because you know you're prioritizing innovation and of course, and the other means are very important issue. How would you respond to that? No, so I think first of all, I I think uh, the perception that it's shrinking is uh, certainly wrong. I would actually respond, uh, Swamendra, in the following manner: that for the thirty odd years that we have recognized uh, the power of the internet, uh, we have been, uh, to quote a phrase that I just recently learned, we have been techno optimists. So we have essentially celebrated the power of. Uh, technology in general and internet to do good and uh, have woken up belatedly to the the problems that the tech and the same internet also represent in terms of criminality and harms so if today we are making a correction in that uh, techno optimism and saying that we don't need to regulate and therefore let it uh, just grow and innovation should just grow as much as possible uh, we have certainly changed significantly the the thought process has changed uh, certainly in the government of india certainly in uh, many governments ar- around the world that are also talking about safety and trust so that's point number 1 however i think to now say that that call for safety and trust is infringing on any other right that existed pre that i think is to read this wrong because safety and trust is not something that the government is doing for itself it is doing for the vast majority of the users of tech and internet it is it is as much a right law and order and safety and trust is as much a right on cyberspace and on the internet as freedom of speeches or freedom of anything is 
So I think we have to understand that there is a, there is a, the pendulum has swung from being a free for all, uh, eternally utopian, techno optimist uh, approach to tech and internet to evolving a balance between the need to innovate, the need to grow, as well as have very clearly rights for those who are citizens and digital nagriks on the internet. And I think that balance, India is in a sense leading the way and shaping the contours of that uh, regulatory framework, if you want to call it that, more than any other country, because we, cert we certainly are the largest connected nation in the world, the largest single block of internet users is in India, so therefore we have in some sense an obligation to do it even if others don't. So, so this uh, overall of the uh, digital, uh, you know, the regulatory architecture, that's certainly was due, that's been, uh, it's, it's quite archaic, uh, and it's 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 a great start to have made with the data prediction deal. Uh, but one of the concerns that uh, that people raise is that uh, the government has uh, bestowed upon itself, uh, you know, very very overarching sort of uh, powers on uh, uh, on how to regulate. And you said earlier that the government cannot be compared with private entities. It has certain national security imperatives, etc. But uh, in terms of striking the balance or on things like the constitution of the data protection board, the fact that the government has a fairly substantial role in the way it's constituted, has, uh, just to take his question forward, has that balance been struck? I think it has. And I, I, I think also, while I say I think it has, uh, I think we must also accept that this is a work in progress. There is nothing about the architecture that India is today putting into place that is final. It will continue to evolve. And we have cer certainly something that most other nations, certainly in our neighborhood, don't have, which is that we have a very proactive judiciary that will read down any trespass of the government into areas that go beyond 19.2. So I don't think we should worry about this. I think, A, we must recognize that we are going from almost a free-for-all, laissez-faire approach to innovation, to some guardrails that are being put there that will protect citizens who are beneficiaries and users of tech and innovation, to uh, later on this natural, let's say, tension between how far do these guardrails go without infringing on fundamental rights, which, without infringing on certain other rights that exist in the Constitution or in the law. So, and that adjudication of that, that test that uh, will get resolved increasingly as jurisprudence around the cyberspace develops. Anil, today we have a 22-year-old law which is essentially the jurisprudence that guides the internet. And, uh, you know, it's an act that does not even mention the word internet. So I think we must be fairly confident that we will take these tentative steps in a particular direction which is slightly different from the past. And that those, that, that those steps will also have challenges. Those will come up with unforeseen challenge, uh, opportunities, challenges. But we must always have confidence that in India today, anybody, and as I was when I was an MP, I was busy in court, uh, regularly challenging Section 66, privacy is a fundamental right, that there will always be people who uh, think that they should defend uh, people's rights and citizens' rights. And whenever the government trespasses, the court will intervene. So to take the point forward about how much you can push the envelope vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, how much you can regulate, uh, of course, you know, there are trade-offs whenever you make any yeah. major policy decision. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the final Data Protection Act, as we have it now, is understood to be largely easy to be compliant with. Uh, the industry, is, there's, there's a general consensus on that. But the last thorn in the bush seems to be, you know, uh, uh, the, the norms around consent framework for children. And since we're talking about, you know, keeping young people safe on the internet, uh, you know, it, it appears that that is one provision where the companies seemingly have come out, you know, asked for a longer period to sort of develop a framework, etc. I just want to understand, you know, A, we've had a privacy law since 2017 when privacy was established as a fundamental right to 2023. You know, it was already six years delayed, the, the, the privacy framework, and it appears that it'll be delayed further at least with some specific provisions, specifically the ones dealing with children and young people on the internet. You know, as we discussed, and of course the discussion is important, but also in the meantime, aren't we leaving young people vulnerable the longer we delay this? So, the, the answer is yes. I mean, uh, uh, so certainly if you ask me, the law should have been in place many years ago, the rule should have been in place, yes, in place yesterday. 
But as I've said, uh, Somendra, in many of these consultations that we have, we would rather do it right than do it into an artificial timeline and meet some headline, uh, you know, and say that we've done it fast and then run into all kinds of perils. You know, the history of legislation is that all good intentions when legislated too hurriedly without adequate thought uh, certainly find themselves being very limited in terms of their scope or find themselves with loopholes that are then exploited by people. So we are doing the rules that, are, that you are referring to very carefully. There are certain very deep, significant changes in the framework that will evolve as a rule because you understand today most platforms deal with the users anonymously. They don't even make an attempt to verify who the user is, whether it's a man or a woman, whether it's a bot or a man or a woman, whether it is a child or a man or a woman. So I think we are going into a framework, especially in child gate, age gating, where platforms have to evolve a framework where they have to determine who the person is. So these are not trivial or these are not insignificant. So these are changes that will take time, that will require a particular framework that is absolutely uh, future ready and that uh, can be tested in scale and in terms of all the other um, scenarios that will be thrown at the platform. So don't grudge us this extra few months. Uh, I think I would rather today, and I, that is our government's uh, responsibility to build. When we do this, we want to do this right. Uh, the DPDP, as you know, the Prime Minister very, very uh, significantly and bravely took a decision to repeal the previous law because it was going uh, in a totally different tangent and becoming complex. And he said, look, okay, fine, we'll repeal it and let's quickly do a new bill. And we did a, what I believe is an absolutely modern framework, an evolvable framework, futurity framework. So give us some time on the rules. Uh, it, it will certainly be something that will be working, workable and future ready. And will address this significant change in the model from going from full anonymity to having some way of determining who your user is uh, for the purposes of both uh, criminal investigation and for the purposes of child age gating. Uh, you represented India at Bletchley Park. Uh, you were there when the landmark AI declaration was signed, India as a signatory, and of course the recognition of frontier AI as a risk. But you know, India's, India said that, or your statement there was that we need to balance the opportunities. Uh, there is an opportunity in AI and uh, and that we'd follow a risk-based user harm approach. But we seem to have moved quite a bit over the last year. In April, you know, the government had sort of asserted that there's no plan to regulate or intervene. There seems to be a change in the, uh, in the direction. Uh, or, you know, or is, the, is, there, is, there a, is there a small pivot in what's sort of led to, led to this? No, Anil, we have been consistent from 2021. Uh, we have laid out the guardrails or the foundational blocks around which uh, everything we do in technology will be based on, which is openness. Therefore, the tech, whether it's a platform, whether it's the internet, should not be dominated by any state or any country or any uh, few big tech companies. Uh, openness is an important uh, attribute for uh, open choice and um, you know, free choice for our consumers, uh, digital nagriks. Safety and trust, we've talked about the second element that's safe the internet, because there are 83 crore Indians today using the internet, there will be 120, 130 crore Indians using it. Man, woman, old, young, uh, rural, urban, literate, not so literate. We want the internet to be safe and trusted. That is an article of faith. It is a duty for us to our consumers and digital nagriks. And we want uh, platforms to be legally accountable. These three broad principles we have espoused from 2021. It is the same framework that we take to AI. And as a matter of fact, I think the rest of the country, world is catching up. And the AI Safety Summit in, uh, in Bletchley Park was essentially a readback of what we, was, we have been saying as a country and what the Prime Minister has been saying for the last two years, that we must learn how to harness technology for the good. Technology can do tremendous good for our people. It can create uh, the kind of empowerment that nothing else can. But at the same time, we must be visibly, clearly aware that we need guardrails to prevent the bad actors from misusing technology. And uh, I think that is precisely how we are looking at AI. Uh, our Prime Minister has said it. I, we completely uh, support and agree with that vision 
that AI is the simply the biggest and the big, most important invention in our times as, uh, as human beings. And uh, we don't want to demonize AI. We certainly don't want the narrative of uh, risks of AI to get so far ahead of the innovation of AI that we lose sight of uh, what AI can do for us and for the digital economy and for our people. So just to follow up on that, uh, you know, we, we've seen uh, in the US in, in the form of an executive order, Correct. very direct, very specific action on, you know, how AI systems are supposed to be built, how LLMs are supposed to be built. Europe is understood to be, you know, also working on, on AI specific legislation. But that conversation hasn't really kickstarted in India yet where, you know, of course, I mean, you know, you have to balance innovation and also rights and whatever the challenges that come with AI. But that conversation itself is yet to begin in the form that it's already happening in the US and EU. Yeah, so, I, I, so again, Swamitra, I don't think we need to necessarily uh, walk in the path of a conversation that's happening in Europe. Uh, and there's this very interesting book by Anu Bradford that I recommend uh, people who are interested in read called Digital Empires. There is a certain approach by Europe which is based inherently on regulation for the rights of citizens. And then the US approaches this uh, from a point of view of regulation for markets. I think India is today laying out, and you will hear this in the GPA that is on the 12th, 13th, and 14th of December, and on the 10th of Jan, we will have the first Global India AI Summit. Our approach is a hybrid of both. We don't think markets alone can regulate innovation and AI in particular, nor should we allow our fixation on uh, rights and regulation to in a sense, um, derail the power of AI. So you will see our approach is a uh, approach and the PM uh, recently posted something that says, we certainly are determined to harness the power of AI for our people and on for our economy. At the same time, we want to make sure that AI is safe for individuals and their communities. So that in a sense summarizes our approach. The legislation, legislation for this is the Digital India Act. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll be able to catch the legislative window before the elections because we need certainly a lot of consultation and debate and discussion around it. But we certainly have a roadmap of what is legislation, what is our policy goals, and what are the policy principles for safety and trust. The United States seems to have sort of wrested uh, leadership or some sort of control with that executive order that Samirendra mentioned. Uh, the EU has generally led on tech and it's been focused largely on regulation. Right. Uh, the US also has to sort of balance out the innovation concerns. Uh, do you see, uh, you know, India playing uh, uh, a role here in terms of at least charting out a path that might be maybe, you know, a midway sort of a thing? And does this, uh, this global uh, uh, summit that we have on uh, uh, AI, the GPI, is, uh, do, you, do you have some plans uh, on that? I think, Anil, when you invited me last to the idea exchange, if I recall, uh, you, some, you, you or somebody, I, think, I don't know who it was, but one of your team asked me about AI. And I said then, and I repeat now, <clears throat> and it's there, it's, I, I've saved that uh, interview. I said, India will not be an insignificant player in the development of AI. I said it then, and I repeat today. And I'll tell you why. Our approach to AI is very, very uh, well thought through, even if you say so myself. We are going to collect the largest collection, diverse, most diverse collection of data sets, which is raw material for uh, LLMs and foundational models. We are going to create, uh, and you'll hear the, about this in January, uh, the Prime Minister is going to help us build AI compute infrastructure to train these models. And we are focusing not just in competing with the next generative AI type of, uh, open AI type of, a, uh, let's say, fashionable thing to do, but we are focusing on real life use cases. Healthcare, agriculture, governance, language translation. All of these applications of AI will have real use, immediate use in our market. So our approach is around real life use cases and the enabling infrastructure of that the government of India is going to invest in. The, world, the startup and the private sector ecosystem, we have got uh, major MOU signed with con companies like IBM uh, already uh, in AI. So I think you may think that this is, our approach is not as noisy as the executive order from the US or as visible as the AI Act of the EU. But I am, as, a, as somebody, a grizzled veteran of tech for about three decades, I think 
we will be major players as AI rolls out over the next two to three years. Just to pick up from uh, what you said about, you know, uh, of course the government is also trying to build up data sets, etc. I don't think that that's, that's, that's an attempt or that, that any other government around the world is, you know, that's, that's not the path that anyone's taking. So I just want to understand from you, you know, the dynamics of a market where the government which governs 1.3 plus billion people sitting on their anonymized personal data and trying to collate all of that into one, uh, you know, in, into one big data set or whatever, like different data sets, etc. Uh, also to attempt to, you know, encourage, request, whatever the word that you would prefer right now, big companies to sort of contribute to that data set, the Googles and the metas of the world. Uh, what, what does the di market dynamic of that look when the government is, is an active stakeholder, not just as a regulator of AI, but also as someone who's actively, you know, putting together things that are going to help certain companies, which are domestic, of course, in nature, I'm believing. So how does the market dynamics of something like that look like going yeah. forward? So that I, and I'll refer to what Anil just said. I think we are very clear that we are determined that we must have our own sovereign AI. And we don't believe, I mean, we can take two options. One is to say, look, as long as there is an AI ecosystem in India, whether that is Google, Meta, uh, Indian startup, Indian companies, Dribble, we should be happy about it. But we certainly don't think that's enough. We think that there is an opportunity here for India to also have something which is more sovereign and not more unique, something that like India DPIs as the, you know, the DPIs that we are now uh, giving to the global south and all of the other people who are excluded from technology, that our AI can certainly shape uh, global conversation with the global trends in AI. So therefore, the data sets which otherwise would be acquired by private companies and train their models. Which, as you know, to the DPDP, there is a break that has been put on that process with a lot of restriction. The only other way is to have, for sovereign AI, is to have a government, not curated or managed or uh, uh, approved, but a government-sponsored India data set platform. Now, it could be that over the over time, this is becomes a Section 8 type of a company, non-profit. It could be something that is a PPP with the Indian startup ecosystem. Uh, they, 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 that's a work in progress. We can think about how it will be. But don't certainly don't consider this as the government of India sort of collecting data and saying, I'll give it to you and I will not give it to you or I'll give it to you and I'll not give it. That's certainly not the intention. We think data is certainly, as especially anonymized person data, is certainly going to be fuel to it. so to power AI innovation, we want to maximize and therefore enable the maximization of the collection of the data sets and their availability to our to our ecosystem to create sovereign AI models and sovereign LLM and foundation models. So on deep fakes, uh, you know, you've suddenly seen this debate now, you know, uh, you know picking pace, and obviously there's an there's an extension of artificial intelligence in terms of how. You know, it comes to uh, uh, you know to 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 be used using tools that that probably anybody can read. You know? How do you see regulation in that space? Would it be part of the larger AI architecture that we're working towards? And in the run up to the lectures, uh, is there a, is that a is that a, a, a concern? So, uh, Anil, we have you know, if you follow what we've been saying, we have been talking about these harms out of, on the internet for some patent and therefore safety and trust that we've kept advocating, evangelizing. I'm actually very pleased to today that the awareness of these issues or challenges of the internet is far higher than let's say when I started battling privacy in 2012. And I just want to refresh everybody's memory that when I first raised uh, that privacy is an important uh, right for digital citizens. Uh, there was huge pushback from everybody saying that this is a very intellectual and at any concept. If you fast forward to the, for the last decade, it is certainly clear and you will love questions so at the points of all, that today people are much more aware of their digital rights as well as uh, any other way. So I think the fact that Eat fakes is now understood that the Almut Prime Minister did us all a great service by highlighting that. He's a huge threat to individual liberty, to communities, to societies, to families, as misinformation has been, and I have pointed out in the past, that this is really taking misinformation and taking it to a factor of 
one thousand one million. Uh, so it is misinformation plus AI equals deep fakes and makes it much more difficult to discern and treat. it plays to a trend in this consumption of video. Earlier, it was misinformation text, people would read it, most people have been filming Insta and Reels and so on and so forth. It's a photo that was just between them. Political ecosystem, but this is becoming a serious set that has been excellent coverage by Indian experts and other papers about the problem. We are approaching this as essentially seeking absolutely a zero or gap violation, totally zero tolerance violation by the platform. Uh, I had a reasonably uh, angry meeting with the platform, I was called it angry, uh, recently on the 24th. And I, I told them, look, you know, have you forgotten to read English? Because in the rules, it says that the room three one be five, and you are not supposed to have this information. You are not supposed to have patently false information on the platform, or you risk being prosecuted uh, and losing safe harbor. Now we are going an extra mile, and we would create in-app grievance reporting and harm reporting. We are basically uh, also talking about ensuring that they educate their users more and more about the 11 no-go areas of content. So if I'm a user of a platform and I log in, at the time of login, it should be very clear that terms of you should say, these 11 things you cannot do on my web. I'll keep repeating and reminding users so that behavioral changes uh, we, we can expect from me users. And if that all of that doesn't work, then I think finally, if people persist on violating the law, that the law should be applied to them and we will make it very, very difficult for people to violate the law and continue to be platformed in India. We will certainly create the necessary deterrence and disincentive for that. If necessary, down the road, like I said, with BIA or any other regulation that is required, we will enact. But we consider this an uh, important challenge, not just to politics and electoral dynamics, but also to the larger safety and trust of our main users and digital knowledge. Sir, uh, for a moment, I'd urge you to put on your, you know, you've been a technologist for a very long time and now you've been a lawmaker for a while. I, I'd urge you to put on both the hats at the same time and also as an observer of technology and also as, a, as an active user of technology. Of course, you know, we, no discussion about online safety would ever be complete without encryption or talking about encryption, right? You know, as, 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 as the roles that you've played in your life so far, what will you say is the future of encryption? You know, there is a tussle and it seems that companies have at, that is one line where the countries have drawn a very hard line. Is that, that in, breaking encryption or crossing encryption in a way that, that doesn't suffice for them is something that they don't want to compromise on at all. We've seen that, you know, started from the Apple case uh, in the US, etc. And of course, upon which that in fact in, 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 in India here with WhatsApp, Meta, etc. So what do you say is the future of encryption? I mean, is the tussle going to continue or are governments going to have the wave in black box? So, so first of all, let me clarify, I wear both the hats all the time so that uh, I never take off these hats. Uh, Look, there are a number of things in the normal of tech that are going to have to be revisited, re-looked at, and examined again. One is, for example, very base level is the anonymous use of platforms, uh, especially in the context of illegality. How does anonymity and violation of law coexist? Can they coexist? So that is number one. We have attended to something to the first originator of the community provision. So that is what it is. Second is, and this is, again, I'm tapping with three very fundamental things. The second is the safe harbor concept. Uh, there is a feeling amongst platforms, which has been, I've attempted to disabuse, that the safe harbor is some sort of absolute right. And we have now evolved a framework that makes it extremely conditional upon them doing the right thing vis-a-vis -vis content on the blood. So this is the second thing that needs a debate and discussion, and we think we'll have it during the DI acres and a third of this issue of privacy versus lawful uh, interception, which has always been a framework for all democracies in the world, which is lawful interception in the in the end of national security, terrorism, is something that governments around the world have always used in the past. So how do we square on these two things in the internet space? Uh, I don't have an answer for that. I certainly, depending on how you pose the question, I will be in favor of encryption uh, to protect the consumers and citizens' privacy. On the other hand, uh, I, I recognize that we live in uh, in a world where 
terrorism, as we've seen uh, recently, rears his head and um, poses a real danger to people. So how do we square up these two seeming contradictions? I think we need to talk this. But I don't think it is simply anymore about, oh, I have safe harbor because I'm not a publisher, done with. I will have anonymous user, users because that protects their privacy, not possible. Uh, and uh, I will have encryption uh, because, again, that is about privacy and that these are zero-sum sort of arguments. I don't think that is the world we live in. We need to now have some sort of a conversation about a new normal around these three points. What that normal is, I have got in a position to click. I think we're pretty much out of time. So, you know, I'd like to thank you for taking us through, frankly, as always, uh, through uh, some of these really fundamental issues and uh, somewhat contentious topics as well. Uh, thank you for taking our time. Sir. Thank you, Agal. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.